You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Welcome to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My Unusually Well-Informed guest today is Laura Forzik. Laura is an astrophysicist and planetary scientist. She is founder of the space consulting firm Astrolytical. She has worked with NASA-related research and the international space industry for over 15 years. Today, Laura and I are going to discuss the exciting developments in space industry and technology, as well as her book, Rise of the Space Age Millennial. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. So, Laura, you and I share a fascination with space, but you've made a living out of it. What is it about humanity's ambitions in space that makes it so fascinating to you? I think that everybody who loves space has this similar passion for going where we haven't gone before and understanding the universe that we don't yet understand and and really trying to connect it back to home and our place within the greater picture and the greater solar system, the greater universe. And, And it's really been a journey because I started out as an astrophysicist studying exploding stars. And then I sort of got closer and closer to home studying the moon and uh, how dirt and dust moves on the moon. And now I do all kinds of work. Um, you know, usually it is uh, close to home work where it's either in low earth orbit or, you know, lunar, cis lunar, which means between the earth and the moon. Um, and, and also, how to connect that to businesses here on earth. And, and I just love that connection piece because we take it for granted that space is integrated into our modern society in ways that um, most people don't realize. And so that's also something I really appreciate about space. The more I learn about it is how much it can and already has benefited humanity. Absolutely. And that's the theme that comes through in your book a lot is that we are I mean, we still want to explore, but we're in a transition from just exploring to actually exploiting the capabilities of what we can do in space. Right. And this isn't something new. This has actually been going on for decades. You know, telecommunications and Earth observation, for example, are are some of the earliest applications of space data. And um, human space like it's a lot of the attention, but that's true really in its infancy still. We're still trying to learn how to live and work in space, even with all of the decades of operations in space, you know, 20 years on the space station continuously living and working in space. And we're still trying to understand how microgravity and the radiation and all of the psychology and all of it just interacts with, um, you know, our humanity because it's such a foreign environment. Absolutely. And so one of the things you mentioned is, you know, you work kind of close to home. You have your own uh, consulting firm. What kind of work do you do in that consulting firm? All kinds of space related work. So space science, space industry, space policy for startups and, and established companies, government agencies, nonprofits, educational institutes, investors. I mean, really um, all kinds of people plus individuals because we do space career coaching as well for people who are either students or young in their careers pursuing a a space career or people who always wanted to work in space but worked in a different career and then want to transition as they're older, which actually tends to be the majority of my clientele. And so um, it's really helping people where they are with whatever the project is, whether that is, you know, a space career or whether that is uh, working on a spaceport or trying to expand their space business or or trying to operate in microgravity, you know, all these kinds of things that um, make up the space activities that we see going on. And then looking forward to future space activities. Well, what is NASA going to do next? And, and what is industry going to accomplish next? And, and all of that and how it interacts. And, and some of my favorite parts are helping answer those questions for people who are just beginning to explore how they might get involved, you know, for example, um, you know, investors, they, they are a newer segment of my, my clientele where a lot of investment this year has gone into space. And I see that growing even more in the coming years. And a lot of times investors, they have this interest in space, but they don't know where to, to focus. And so I help them look and see, you know, what are the most promising segments to watch out for in the space sector? Well, I can't let that go. What are some of the most promising uh, sectors in, in space? 
I'm really excited about some of these uh, newer technologies that do satellite servicing or, um, you know, space tugs or fuel depots, you know, that kind of thing that's sort of coming on board to provide the infrastructure. Because even though rockets get all the attention, right, everyone loves the fire and the excitement of a rocket launch, um, you know, the rockets are just the initial transportation. And then what happens when somebody is in orbit, or, or I should say a space asset is in orbit, what happens if they want to go beyond, you know, to get to the moon or get to, to Venus or wherever they want to go. Um, and, and of course, the science that's being done. So my background is in science, planetary science and astrophysics. And I'm part of a segment of the population that really focuses on how do you use all segments of space, whether that is just going up for five minutes and coming back down in suborbital space, or whether that's going around in orbit, you know, maybe on a space station, whether it's International Space Station or a new one, or whether that is actually actually going to the moon and doing a, a orbiter or a lander or a rover on the lunar surface. And I'm trying to understand how do we you know, unravel the mysteries of the other worlds out there in our solar system. And of course, things like Europa and you know, astrobiology and all that stuff. I'm not a biologist, but I find it fascinating, the search for life out there. Um, and that's, that's away from the commercial industry and more towards just pure exploration, which tends to be more government driven. Um, but I still find it fantastic. I'm really excited about all the possibilities that we might see in the coming decades of where we might go next. There's so much in that answer. And of course, I, I've become a little bit familiar with your work as I prepared for the show. And, and what's striking is you really do cover an awful lot of water. Um, I guess in space, there's very hard, it's very hard to come by water, but you know what I mean? Like the waterfront <laughs> is huge. All the technologies, all the types of projects how do you manage to stay abreast of so much going on in the space industry? Oh, no one can. It's too broad because it's not a space industry. Space is simply a place where many industries operate. And so, for example, I'm a lot less familiar with like the military and defense side of things, but I still try to keep abreast of that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm much more biased towards the United States um, than I am. I, I try to keep in, you know, informed about what's going on in Europe and Asia and all these other places where space activity is happening. But my bias is here towards the United <laughs> States. And there's so much here in the States. That of course. You can't even keep track of all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I spend all of my hours <laughs> reading, researching, listening to podcasts. Uh, really, I'm addicted to podcasts. So um, it, it's uh, a lot to keep on top of. But when it's a passion, like it is mine, like I would do this for free. And so no one pays me to read these articles, right? It's just me um, keeping myself informed because I love what I do. So. Speaking of uh, being in the United States, one of the things that's going on in the United States is a shift. Um, there are some people who are resisting the shift, but a lot of the, certainly the launch activity is going from, from uh, government kind of orchestrated to being private enterprise. So you've got these, what they call the billionaire space race, where you've got SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. Who's winning that race? Let's start there. Well, it's not a race exactly, because a race implies that you have a starting line and a similar track and a finish line. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing different companies compete, just like in any other industry. And what's different here is that we have some high profile um, competitions, let's say, where, of course, we have um, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, um, especially this past summer, where we had the, quote, billionaire space race, which is a little bit silly. Um, but you might have seen that, you know, Virgin Galactic flew Richard Branson a couple of weeks before uh, uh, Blue Origin flew Jeff Bezos. And those are the two billionaire founders of those respective companies. Um, but you know, that I think is a lot less important than the, the future market for suborbital human spaceflight and what's being done on these space flights because the, what was largely overlooked with that Virgin Galactic flight was there was science. The very first human tended suborbital science ever done was on that flight because previously all the science done on suborbital spacecraft were automated. Um, and now you have the ability to launch people, whether it's the scientists themselves or a proxy that can do these experiments in real time. And I find that really great. Um, also looking ahead to, you know, uh, the, the ways that spaceflight can affect people and how, you know, it, it's commonly called the overview effect. That's the umbrella term that was coined by Frank White, who wrote a book called the overview effect and, and whether that, that, um, 
you know, that uh, cognitive shift is universal, we don't know, or whether it's dependent on how long you're in space. So do suborbital <laughs> uh, flyers have that same um, change in their perspective that an orbital flyer might have? Or we just don't know. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out mm-hmm. and also how people change their thoughts about what it even means to be an astronaut, because that term has been very much debated recently, very much in flux. Um, (laughs) And so what what is an astronaut? And and, and does that even matter in the long run as we change our terminology? A hundred years from now, are we we, we still talking about astronauts? I don't know. Um, But you asked about races, and that's just one particular um, competition that's in the limelight. Another one would be like SpaceX and Blue Origin, for example, where they're competing to get contracts from NASA to land humans on the moon. Mm -hmm. So far, SpaceX has won that one, where SpaceX <laughs> has gotten that first contract to do the very first lunar landing since 1972. And unless this new lawsuit that Blue Origin filed is won by Blue Origin, which is unlikely, then SpaceX is going to keep that. But it could be in the future. I mean, there's that was just the first landing, right? There's going to be a second landing. There's going to be a third landing, hopefully, right? Hopefully it won't all be canceled like Apollo. And so um, other companies are going to get a chance to compete to do things like land people on the surface of the moon or, or take them around the moon, cislunar or, or lunar orbit. And, um, you know, things like that, where... Um, yeah, there, there's all different ways that um, the applications are opening up for different ways that we can act in space. And it's not just all people, too. I'm also thinking SpaceX and um, OneWeb and Amazon and all these other companies that want to do small sat constellations in low Earth orbit for Internet and bringing Internet down to uh, remote areas of the world that either do not have access to Internet or have spotty access to the Internet. Or maybe it's just outpriced. Um, right now we get internet from geo, which is a geostationary orbit, which is higher up. So there's more of a delay with the signal getting down to, to the ground. With Leo, it's closer. And so it's it's a lot, it's called latency. There's, there's less latency, there's less of a delay. Um, and so that's another competition. So again, these aren't races, um, but then you can bring it to like the space race, right? And consider the geopolitics of it, where right now politicians are trying to create a, a sort of a false space race between the United States States and China, mm-hmm. where China is trying to catch up to do things that that NASA has already done. Um, and they're catching up pretty fast. I have to admit, they're doing really well with their own space program and, and the ways that they're um, partnering with their, um, you know, their allies. And, and Russia is one of their allies that they're partnering with. And so you do have the geopolitics come into play where politicians are using that and, and NASA leadership included are, is using that kind of terminology of a new space race in order to get more funding for NASA in order to increase the urgency in the eyes of politicians to say that they are nationalistic and therefore they want to support the U.S.'s um, you know, efforts around the world to be a continuous leader, whatever it is they say. Um, so those are different ways that the term race is used. Um, and I don't agree with any of them. <laughs> and arguably, there wasn't even a space race between the United States and Soviet Union because it wasn't exactly race. And if it was, then maybe the kind of Soviet Union kind of won it because Yuri Gagarin did launch first, yes. even though we're the United States is the one who got to the moon first. Um, so different ways to look at it. But I love the competition. It's a competition just like any other competition in business. And then we're going to see more and more of that as um, you know, commerce increases with space activities. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you that the competition is probably a better word. Um, it's funny how there's, uh, it's almost like there's a habit formed where we want a cold a cold war because the, the you know the Chinese and the Russians are trying to egg on the Americans and vice versa and I just saw a video today and I think it was a Chinese kind of propaganda reel but they they tried to claim that because they weren't Chinese scientists weren't allowed on board the ISS they said it should be called the American uh uh, uh what does SS stand for? Something station, space station. International so the space ASS. Station. They were. It, it was just kind of a funny. <laughs> That's a funny acronym. Uh, you know, like they, they just so petty. I thought that was cute. Um, they have a point, right? Because China had been excluded explicitly from yeah. the partnership. Um, and the International Space Station did start out as a concept of space station freedom. And I'm not a historian, so I don't know how all that changed and evolved into what we see today. 
But there is there there is a point there where the United States is the primary funder of the ISS. And and even as we look forward to the Gateway, which is a future space station around the moon, and it is again primarily funded and built by um, the United States. And and so there's going to be international partners, and there already have been international contracts or contracts issued, but. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting to see how that plays out, and especially with something called the Artemis Accords, which is a, uh, a, a sort of a guideline a, a agreement between, I think it's 12 countries now, with the United States as the leader of uh, trying to establish how to move forward in space with space activities, and especially lunar activities, but really it's, it's, it's broader than that. And it's a, a, a continuation of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, um, and it's uh, it's unfortunate that China and Russia have not yet signed, um, but um, it, it, it's also interesting to see how that plays out in the future and who ends up joining that uh, accord, that partnership. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I put myself in the in the shoes of anybody who's been in the International Space Station and think that for a while there, the only ride home was the space shuttle. And now, you know, they're, they're depending on how you look at it, and so is, but not for the entire time, I don't think. I don't think there was ever a time where Soyuz was not operational. No? Again, okay, so that's good. I, I didn't realize that. Okay, so that makes things... Actually, no, it was the other way around. Soyuz was the only way home. It wasn't the shuttle because there was a time without the shuttle. Um, but now there's so many other possibilities that, you know, if, if somebody said to Elon, we need to get people out of this the, the uh, space station, you know, a couple of weeks notice, you might be able to pull it off. Whereas back in the day, you were really alone out there. Yeah, it's exciting to see the uh, the logistics. You can see it now. You can see one capsule has to de-dock from the International Space yeah. Station and move around so another one can dock in this place. And it's yeah. like musical chairs a little bit, which is fun. And I love seeing it. And it just goes to show that... Um, the initial concept of the International Space Station didn't foresee this much activity. I don't think, uh, no. again, I'm not a historian, but I, I would bet that they certainly didn't expect to see commercial uh, capsules docking. So even though we don't have a uh, Boeing CST-100 Starliner operational yet, we do have um, two operational uh, crew dragons and then two more in development, I think it is, or, or something like that. Um, and so it's really exciting to see how that all comes together with uh, the commercial companies and the government agencies and how they're all um, playing well together or not, because <laughs> there's still a little bit of conflict between the Russians trusting SpaceX for some reason. Uh, but I love seeing it. I, I, I hope we see more of that. And I hope we see more space stations, because right now there are two. There's the International Space Station, there's the new Chinese Space Station. And in the future, we hope to see commercial space station. So a company called Axiom Space has mm -hmm. already won a contract to attach modules onto the International Space Station that will disengage from the space station at the end of the International Space Station's life and become the Axiom Station, a free-flying station. And so there's other companies as well that want to do their own space station. So I hope we're going towards a future where there's I don't know how many, an unlimited number of space stations in, you know, in Earth orbit and lunar orbit and all over the place. It really doesn't matter because we can keep expanding outwards. And, and I, 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 I'm a little bit of a fan of the Gerard K. O'Neill O'Neilling cylinder concept, um, mm -hmm. which we're still a long way to go there. But if you're not familiar, you can look up some of the great graphics that are out there of um, rotating space stations where there's whole civilizations um, with a sort of a biodome um, you know, beautiful structures where we can kind of mimic the way that we live here on Earth in space. And I'm, I don't know if that's going to turn out, but I, I'm excited to see if it does. Well, yeah, I think I think I, I, there there has to be a point at which people, you know, regular people are living in space. And, and I think one of the debates going on, um, you know, we'll turn back to uh, some of the back and forth between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Um, Elon is saying we should settle Mars and uh, Jeff is saying we should build O'Neill cylinders. Uh, I think you were, there's two kinds, right? There's the ones that you saw in 2001 the space odyssey. That's like the ring shape. And then there's the whole tube that is long and right. thin, yes. but enormous and big enough that you can put a spin on it and have gravity in it. There's two ways of looking at it. One is Mars is a hostile environment, but then so is space. 
And at least there's stuff on Mars that we can harvest to make a habitat. Where do you fall on? I imagine your answer is both, but where do you think we'll first settle? Will it be in a habitat or on Mars? Yeah, I certainly don't think we should limit ourselves. And why? Um, You know, if if you're talking about government funding, well, that's limited. But when you're talking about private capital, that's unlimited. And and we are only as limited as far as our imaginations. And of course, we run into barriers and we run into delay slips and all of that. So I can't tell you timelines, but um, I would guess that there's a push within NASA and within the, the human psyche to get to Mars. And that has been there since we landed Apollo 11 on the moon. Mm-hmm. So for many decades now, for over 50 years, there's been this call to send humans to Mars. Now, whether or not we end up um, with you know permanent bases on Mars, I don't know. I hope so. But um, I think that will probably be first. But on the same um, time, like, we, we already see this interest, this great interest from a lot of companies to do space stations. They're going to be small laboratories at first. They're not going to be big space hotels or, or um, you know, cities in space. But, um, you know, that could progress as we learn how to do in-space manufacturing and has, as we get more capabilities for super heavy lift, like Starship, that can bring up more and more um, infrastructure. Uh, and so it's difficult to know what's going to come first. And any prediction I make is going to be wrong because we're... <laughs> We as a society are really, really bad at predicting the future. And especially within spaceflight, you just need to go back a few years and you can see terrible predictions <laughs> about the future and, and how they're proven wrong. And so whatever I think is probably going to be wrong. Uh, but I hope that we do both. So, um, you know, there's a there's a Dan Rather tweet. And unfortunately, it gets into this idea of a space race again. But I think I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Rather. He's a mm-hmm. former uh, news anchor. He wrote yeah. the space race of the 1960s was fueled by American taxpayers. This space race is fueled by non taxpayers. And I, I bring that quote up just because it's kind of funny. <laughs> But also (laughs) because it it brackets a period of time, like I'm, I'm, you know, you've, you've confessed you're a millennial in your book, I'll confess I'm a Gen X. Um, And so we're far enough apart that I sort of remember what feels like a dip in terms of space activity between the Apollo years and the current kind of commercial rush into space. And a lot of that, that, that time in between was marked what I, I think of as a space shuttle era. And I think one of the, one of the arguments about what happened with the space shuttle, and I will tell you, I built a model out of it, you know, like a, a, a model airplane type of thing. I built one. Cool. It's a beautiful, a beautiful machine. It? And you want to talk about smoke and fire? No, I don't still have it. Unfortunately, I've moved too often. But you know, you'd want to talk about smoke and fire. That thing was was tremendous the way it took off, and then it would land like a plane. Beautiful, but unfortunately, it was super expensive. It, they it took a long time to refurbish and get it back into into space and unfortunately as well tragically it was unsafe and too you know it, it killed people so that kind of marks a time when when america fell behind it feels like or at least fell behind its own ambitions mm-hmm. um do you do you think that that was sort of a natural consequence of the rush in what was a race back with russia in the beginning. And then there was kind of a a breath and, you know, like a retrenchment and then it happened now, or do you think the shuttle slowed things down a bit? Well, I think there's ebbs and flows and it's not just with the, the shuttle, you know, the, the, the incidents that, that prevented shuttle from continuing in the pace that it, it was envisioned. Shuttle was never going to continue on the pace it was envisioned. It was named shuttle because they expected it to fly a whole lot more than it actually did. Um, But even before shuttle, you can see some lulls in activity. Um, And, and, you know, in the 1970s, for example, after the Apollo uh, program was canceled. And again, I'm not a historian and you're talking about things before I was born when (laughs) when you go back that far. But I was privileged to live in Florida um, near the tail end of the uh, shuttle program. In fact, I was a freshman in college at Florida Tech in Melbourne, Florida, when um, I I witnessed the launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia and um, the tragedy that followed after their mission. And um, unfortunately, that that impacted Florida in such a a negative way, not only because we we were so attached to the the space program there, we still are, um, but also because after the space shuttle program ended, a lot of jobs went away. And there was quite a depression there. Um, I don't know if that's the proper economic term, but there was a lot of jobs leaving that area and a lot of people leaving that area. And it was secondary jobs as well, you know, restaurants and hotels and that kind of thing that suffered. And then 
as years went by, it came back and it came back because of SpaceX and more activity with the United Launch Alliance and Blue Origin and all these other companies that have popped up to, um, you know, take the place of that act- activity that once was. Because we do have NASA currently building the space launch system, but it's been so delayed. It hasn't even happened yet. <laughs> they won't get their first flight of SLS until next year. So, In the meantime, while NASA is waiting to launch its own thing again, we have all this other commercial activity dominated by SpaceX's Falcon 9, um, which is just really exciting to see. And so will there be another lull? I can see that um, in the future, if there's another incident, right? There's congressional investigations, but that's not going to stop the industry. The industry is just keep going to go moving forward. And yeah. of course they have to, uh, they have stakeholders, they have, you know, investors. If it's a public educated company, they've got the public, you know, they've got um, other people to account for when there's a safety issue that especially ones that involve the loss of human lives. But um, I don't see that stopping the industry. I don't even see it slowing down that much um, because it's expected. At the beginning of the aviation industry, (laughs) there were a lot more accidents um, and the aviation industry didn't stop. It just kept on going, Mm -hmm. but they developed a really good safety culture. And so now aviation is the most, (laughs) the safest form of of (laughs) travel, right? And so I don't think space is ever going to become super safe, Um, but you know, as the technology matures, and remember, it's still all very young and experimental technology, especially some of these newer vehicles. Um, But as it matures, it'll get safer, and it'll get more common, and it'll get more accessible, and and, and it'll keep going. And hopefully, you know, again, I don't know the future, but hopefully it'll be like that aviation industry, where now we almost take for granted that these fleets of planes exist with all these carriers, and we can just buy a ticket. Well, I mean, SpaceX, on, on, for their part, they're 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 pretty consistent. I mean, they're landing their their first stage. They're putting things in orbit. I mean, the Inspiration Four. I will admit, my heart was in my throat because it was symbolic of many things. It was also sort of symbolic revisiting the idea that we can put just regular folk, you or I, into space, um, and knowing it you know, it went, ended tragically the last, my heart was in my throat the whole time, but it it really does herald a new era where, where, you know, I know they're not necessarily regular folk, but, you know, generally you're either a billionaire or a test pilot and you have to be super athletic. And these were people who were just sort of more, more, more like the rest of us going into orbit. So that must mark a, a new era, I think. I hope so. I mean, this was envisioned during the shuttle era, believe it or not, Mm -hmm. right? So NASA had a program envisioned where it would first fly a teacher in space and then it would fly, you know, a journalist and or whatever their order of things was. And that didn't work out because, again, as you said, Mm -hmm. the shuttles ended up not being safe and they lost Chris McCullough, who was going to be the first teacher in space. Um, And hopefully we won't see history repeat and while there will be accidents and it's inevitable because it is not safe it is it is is always inherently risky to attach yourself to this bomb a controlled explosion and go to space um on the other hand i i do see this continuation of um sort of a partnership between funders and normal people, <laughs> everyday people, right? Um, we're not to say that funders aren't normal everyday people, but this Inspiration4 mission was funded by a billionaire, Jerick mm-hmm. Isaacman. He, um, you can call him an everyday person, <laughs> but um, you know he had wealth, and with that wealth, he sponsored three other individuals who did not have wealth, who were more, you know, everyday representatives of humanity. And I'm hoping we see a lot more of that as time goes on. Uh, Right now we have, uh, for example, Blue Origin handpicking some of its people. It's got two paying customers and uh, a guest and a Blue Origin employee on their next mission. Their first crewed mission had uh, one paying passenger uh, and then a guest and (laughs) and Jeff Bezos and his brother. And his brother, Um, which I was really excited to see Wally Funk fly on that. If, if you don't know the history of Wally Funk, she's an amazing woman, a, a wonderful uh, aviator. You know, she'd been waiting 60 years to fly in space. And so I'm really excited to see her go. But again, the, the, the not in my throat too, for, for all of these missions and, and also for the Virgin Galactic Unity 22 mission, because I knew a couple of the people on board that mission as well. Not, not Richard Branson, but I knew, I knew some of the others. Um, and so 
I actually think it's really promising that within the space community, we are recognizing more and more people who fly because mm-hmm. one of those paying passengers on the, the Blue Origin uh, rocket is the one coming up October 12th is currently when it's scheduled. Uh, one of those people is a, uh, a CEO or a co-founder of a space company that a lot of people in my circle know. And so as we see more and more common people flying that we personally know, it's going to become more realistic for us, or at least it seems more realistic for us to go. And it's not just billionaire sponsors. So um, it's also NASA. NASA is going to be flying um, Alan Stern, they, he was the first person picked to fly on a suborbital, specifically Virgin Galactic, as not a NASA astronaut as you usually think of a NASA astronaut, but as a uh, suborbital researcher to fly on a future mm-hmm. Virgin Galactic mission. A friend of mine, Kelly Girardi, she was chosen by her university that she works for um, to fly in a future Virgin Galactic mission. And so we're seeing all of these other ways to sponsor people pop up with, um, you know, for example, the research missions, or there's uh, actually entertainment reasons to fly people. So there's Space Hero and Discovery Channel and a few other entertainment venues that want to do, you know, reality TV show kinds of things and and fly people to space. And we just saw yesterday a launch of the actress and film director to the International Space Station through the Russian side to film a Russian movie the challenge in space. And so I think we're going to see a lot of that too, where it's sponsored by an employer, which again is not new because I think it was like 1984 or something like that, that Charlie Walker, who was sponsored by McDonnell Douglas Corporation, flew as a a quasi NASA astronaut, they called him payload specialist, to fly with space shuttle. And so this isn't a new concept, uh, but we're seeing it happen more and more and more. (laughs) That sounds great. It reminds me of... uh... Uh, I, I went skydiving, but it was static lines. So you jump out, and as soon as you jump out, the, it pulls the parachute up for you. And as I was falling, I thought, you know, I'm actually not really a parachuter or parachutist or whatever. I'm payload. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure if they brought me into orbit, I'd be like, I'm a payload specialist, right? No, you're just payload. Just sit there. <laughs> There is the um, joke about the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson. People can look that up about uh, ballast if they like. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> he That's did good. Buy them. Just He's making sure politician. we don't go into a circle. Yeah. He's a career politician who flew in space. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what role do you think the SLS will play? Uh, it feels like uh, the private launch companies are, are, are running circles around ULA. Do you think it should continue to be funded? So ULA is a uh, a separate company, but um, its parent partners or their parent um, its parent companies are Boeing and Lockheed Martin. I think those are the ones that you mean. Um, so ULA is not involved necessarily in in the SLS, the Space Launch System, oh, no? or the oh. Orion spacecraft. Boeing builds SLS, and and Lockheed Martin build Orion, and those two companies came together and formed the United mm. Launch Alliance back. Uh, when was that about a decade and a half ago, maybe? Um, and so it's it's interesting, the concept of, you know, NASA owned government owned hardware versus uh, a service, buying a service, uh, you know, buying a ticket on a SpaceX Crew Dragon, um, you know, and and what's winning out right now is obviously the one that's most active, which is Crew Dragon, which is buying a seat. Um, but there's a lot of hesitancy within NASA, within government, especially within certain politicians uh, you know, circles. And, the House of Representatives, for example, there's hesitancy there because what's always been done is safer in their minds than what is new. And there are reasons to um, consider that NASA will pave the way. There are definitely places where NASA, you know, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope, there's, there's no um, you know, profitable reason for a company to build their own James Webb Space Telescope and then have NASA purchase it, at least not at this time. So there's there's ways for both to continue, but in terms of the SLS in particular, it is again hugely over budget and delayed, um, but extremely popular within Congress. So when is it going to be that the opinion shifts and we see, um, you know, again, like you said, SpaceX running circles <laughs> around around NASA? Um, when when is that going to be enough to convince? 
the supporters of SLFs that maybe it doesn't need to be the way it is or a way that always has been. That's not to say that SLS isn't going to be successful in the short term, because it might actually have some really great successes starting next year with Artemis One, hopefully crossing fingers, right? Um, So Artemis One is a mission that's going to be uncrewed with Orion on top, I'm pretty sure. Um, That's just going to test the whole system. Artemis Two is actually going to have people on board. It's not going to land on the moon, but it's going to go around the moon like Apollo 8 did. And then Artemis three is the lunar lander system. And those three missions are the ones that are going to be really key to see how this whole architecture plays out. And I don't fully understand why why wouldn't you take advantage of the whole starship architecture? Because mm-hmm. starship can take off from planet Earth, land on the moon, take off from the moon and land back on planet Earth without needing to attach to SLS and Orion and the gateway. But right now, NASA has it contracted that SpaceX is required to work with SLS Orion and Gabriel. <laughs> and, and I don't know, again, how that's all going to play out after Apollo or after Artemis 3. <laughs> We're just going to have to see. But I do believe that in the long term, SLS is a goner. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it certainly does feel like everything SpaceX has turned their mind to. They've, they've succeeded after a while. I mean, reusability took a little longer than they wanted. Even, even Falcon 1 had its, you know, uh, three disasters on the way to achieving what they, what they hoped, which is putting something into orbit. Um, and they've blown up a few of the starships as well. But, uh, you know, it's almost each time they blow something up, they learn something and they get better and better. Um, do you think Starship will fly this year? I believe they're being held up by the FAA's environmental uh, review. Mm -hmm. So um, I haven't been keeping as close track on that as other people do, but I don't believe that within the timeline that they can launch uh, Starship to orbit this year. Now that doesn't mean that they can't do more suborbital tests, but I don't think they're going to do another suborbital test. I think they're waiting for the the orbital test. And of course, when working with NASA, they're slowed down because NASA has a hold on the, the whole Artemis three contract for the human landing system because of that Blue Origin lawsuit I mentioned previously, but that's not going to stop SpaceX from developing Starship. Starship could be used for a wide variety of applications and not just HLS. Um, And and so I'm excited to see it happen, but I'm also not one of those people who thinks that uh, Starship is immediately going to change the world. Um, I'm hopeful that in the long run, we're going to see evolution just like we saw Falcon 9 being evolutionary. Um, But I, I, I'm waiting, I'm more skeptical. I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting to see that it can, you know, fulfill the promises that people say that it can carry X number of people or X amount of cargo, um, you know, to wherever the destinations are, whether it's, you know, another place on the earth or whether it's moon or, or it's lunar space or low earth orbit or, or, or another orbit. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm a little skeptical until I see it happen because in this industry, you learn to be skeptical. You learn to not take things at face value and to never believe schedules and never believe budgets because those are always wrong. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there's a whole term called Elon time yes. because Elon Musk tends to be aspirational in his timeline. So I never for one moment believed that the Dear Moon Project, which is that mission, that private mission around the moon with Starship, I never once believed it was going to be 2023, but I do believe it will happen. Mm-hmm. When is it going to happen? It almost doesn't even matter when it happens, but it's going to happen. And that's what's really exciting is that they keep on doing it. Even if they're delayed, they keep on going. Yeah, it is exciting to watch. Uh, one of the things with all these new um, launches, I mean, as the launch cadence increases, we're going to need more spaceports. And you highlighted one of the challenges of making a spaceport, and, and that is that regulatory regulatory bodies whether it's national or even in the vicinity, you're like, you know, you're making a lot of noise and we don't want something that can blow up on our doorstep. When you, I think you even said in your, in your bio that you advise on uh, the development of spaceports, what are some of the criteria that go into finding a good one? Well, it's interesting because there's this chicken and egg problem, right? Um, Is there enough demand for more start, you know, whether it is, um, you know, vertical launch or horizontal launch or both, right? So we do have like airports that can double as spaceports because of the whole space plane concept or air to launch, air, air launch to orbit concept um, or vertical launch where it could be, it could be a padless, you know, just a concrete pad, I should say, um, without structure, or it could be something that really needs a big tower and a lot of structure there. Um, and so 
it really depends on the situation. It depends on the players. And that's something that is overlooked a lot. It depends on the users of the spaceport, who's involved, what they're going to be using it for. Because as I just mentioned, those three categories, right, are so vastly different. But the FAA's job is to work on the safety of the uninvolved public. So the people on the ground or the people in the airspace who are not involved at all in the space launch, um, whether it is crewed or uncrewed launch. Um, and so the FAA is just simply looking to see, is this launch going to be safe for the people on the ground or for the airspace? You know, if, you, if you're going to be launching out of like Denver, for example, um, so that's a, a major city with a major airport. And this, this is not something I'm making up. This is an actual, um, you know, consideration. Vertical um, launch? Yeah, yeah. So really? I don't actually remember um, what they're considering at Denver, but there is a proposal to do some kind of um, launch site at Denver. I don't think it was vertical. I think it's actually the space plane concept. But, mm. um, you know, th these are considerations still because that's still a rocket. It just is a rocket that's carried on a plane and then launched from space. <laughs> and so lots of considerations there. And I've never worked on one of these environmental reviews. I've only worked on the surrounding issues of, um, you know, is there support for this? Is there a market? for this? What's the, the secondary benefits of having a spaceport in this area? Um, and, and what do the residents think? And, and how do you convince the residents that this is a good idea? Because the residents uh, actually have a lot of sway in this. They, they're they the ones who can make a lot of noise <laughs> about the noise, right? <laughs> a good or bad, you know, welcoming or not. Um, and that can really make a difference as well. And so um, that's what I'm most familiar with. And it seems like I, I meant to count it. I, I keep thinking that I should count it up, but it seems like about half the states in the United States want to build a spaceport. And then there's countries around the world that want to be space players. And the way that they want to be space players is saying, we have a lot of empty land. Why don't we have a spaceport here? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Except in some cases, it's not actually empty land. In some cases, they want to relocate populations, which has ethical concerns. Uh, but uh, yeah. it's one of those things where um, there's a lot of balance to be had, right? You have to try to figure out the desires of the companies involved and also the needs and, um, you know, opinions of the people on the ground. So one of the things I've been led to believe, maybe you can correct me on this, but for a vertical launch, a lot of there's a reason Texas and Florida are so popular. It's because you're on the West Coast. So you're sort of leaning into the rotation of the Earth. The East Coast. Oh, the East Coast, excuse me. Yeah, you're, close, you're on the East Coast, so you're leaning into the, you're sort of flying into uh, the rotation of the Earth. So you've got that advantage. And you're also close to the equator, which means you're going to, you can, you also take advantage of that. And it's warm all year long, almost all year long. Um, there are other points in the world where those conditions exist. Do you see like a, a crowding around the equator of space activity coming? It could be. Um, but there are other orbits where it might be beneficial, for example, in a polar orbit to launch elsewhere. And even though I'm a physicist, I never actually learned orbital dynamics very well. And so I couldn't actually tell you which places are best for launching what type of orbit. Um, but there is a reason why Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral is the you know most populate, most common place where you see US-based launches. And because it is right there on the East Coast, it's not launching over a population. Um, and, and for all those reasons that you just said, it's close to the equator, et cetera. Um, and again, it, it goes back to a lot of the logistics too. So it's not just populations and safety of people on the ground. It's also, if you're, you're launching from the middle of nowhere, for example, a sea launch. So um, this has been happening. It doesn't happen very often and it's proposed to happen more. But if you're launching in the middle of the ocean, it, it's, it's harder to get there, especially if you're trying to get um, you know, people. <laughs> and, and so if you have people launching or even people landing in the ocean, you have to have recovery vehicles, you have to have um, you know, boats and that kind of thing to um, get the, the cargo, whether it's human cargo or payloads um, to the launch vehicle. And so those are the kind of considerations. And I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea if we're going to end up having a lot of spaceports around the equator or not. Um, but it'll be interesting if we do. I, I'm i looking forward to seeing that future. I don't know if I'll, if I'll be alive for that. Well, uh, but maybe in some you know future you know, sci-fi kind of envision, if there would be a, 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 you know, a band of spaceports around the equator and that just caters to all the launches that we perceive. We're not there yet. So one of no. the reasons why, um, for example, we talk about how most of the 
launchers in development right now, and there's about 150 or, or more launchers in development globally are not going to succeed because one, it's really tough. Two, it's really expensive. And three, the demand probably isn't there. There's a lot of pent up demand, but the demand is not as high as we'd like to think it is. Not yet. Well, I, what this could mean is that space enthusiasts will have nice tans because we'll all be around the equator. So that's good. But yeah, and I, I think I out to Florida when I graduated high school and went off to college and and I'm in, in Atlanta now, but I'm still feeling called to get back to the beach. Absolutely. Um, so the ISS has been a NASA focal point for a long time now. What, what how would you describe its purpose? I'm sorry, the what? The International Space Station. Ah, its purpose. Um, so its original purpose, right, um, is to do scientific studies, uh, you know, different experiments, learning how to live and work in space again, the, the human uh, physiology, uh, you know, and I don't think that purpose has changed a ton. But what we have seen, um, first with the Russians, with Dennis Tito, back, when was that, 15 years ago or so now, maybe a little longer, I've lost track of dates. Um, but uh, it, it's now turning into more commercial based, but it's not, it, and it never was meant to be cost effective. And so you have to have a lot of understanding that you're not going to make much of a profit on the International Space Station. You can make a little bit of profit depending on what you want to do. So there are companies like Axiom, like Space Adventures, uh, who, who are making fun money by taking private astronauts to the International Space Station. And that's exciting. And it's not just astronauts, of course. There's I used to work for CASIS, Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, which also goes by the name ISS National Laboratory. And a lot of what I did was look at what people wanted to send to space and also convince, <laughs> go out there and talk to um, companies, researchers, universities, people who had no idea that they could send anything to space and talk to them about sending their experiment to the International Space Station or their technology development project or whatever it was. Um, and so NASA actually implemented a new policy in 2019 about sending commercial products to space, not necessarily for, for research as it has been in the past, but for purely marketing purposes. And again, NASA's behind the Russians because the Russians had been doing this for, for a while before. Um, and so uh, space is, in, is niche right now, right? It's hard to access and therefore it gets your attention. Um, and so if you've got a product being filmed in space, or you can say this, this product flew in space, like a wine bottle, for example, mm. that's actually stuff that people have done, um, you can maybe do a huge markup on that. Um, but as space becomes more accessible, that will decline. And what will get more common is probably space resources, actually going to the moon or asteroids or wherever and getting resources and bringing that back as a, as a you know, a look, look at this. This is pretty cool. I can make jewelry out of this kind of thing. Probably not for, um, you know, for the rare earth metals or, you know, that kind of stuff, but um, probably just for the cool factor, right? Because it's rare. So when space access becomes less rare, it'll be less common to do that, but more common to do things like entertainment like filming movies in space mm -hmm. that kind of thing, or going on a vacation or, or whatever, um, that'll be a lot more common. Um, so the International Space Station won't last that long. We won't see much of that. Right now, we see a Russian movie being made, and we have um, Axiom's first mission flying currently scheduled for February of next year. Um, but we, we probably won't see the International Space Station lasting all that much longer, maybe another decade at the most, probably. Um, it hasn't been agreed upon yet. And so what's going to accomplish on the ISS in the next decade? A lot of science, some really great science. NASA does a really bad job of communicating the science that is done on the space station, in my opinion, as someone who used to work as a full-time job, trying to figure out what science is done and can be done on space station. Um, but it's also, you know, a test that it's, it's what's the possibility? What are the possibilities within the limitations of what NASA and the uh, partner agencies agree upon that can be done? And so we're seeing new business plans being birthed and, and new um, players getting involved that weren't previously involved. So, you know, countries that are launching experiments or launching payloads or even launching people that have never launched astronauts before, you know? And that's kind of cool to see it as, as this experimental birthplace of, of new ideas and, and new things that can happen for future, you know, business plans are being formed by what's happening right now on Space Station. So it's, it's I'm surprised that I'm old enough to remember Skylab 
as it mm-hmm. came down, you know? And at the time, again, in my mind, at least, it seemed inevitable that if they didn't have a use for it, they'd let it crash because it's really expensive even to get fuel up there to even run a little, like a little engine, like a little rocket engine just to bring it up to a higher orbit. But now that going to space is more routine than it was certainly back then, it seems like they could if they wanted to keep it in orbit. And it just seems like an odd decision, even just for the raw materials that the space that the space station embodies like couldn't we park it in a higher orbit and then get around to recycling it somehow i mean every pound that it weighs is like a thousand bucks to get up there i'm surprised that we would let it crash well it's not been decided yet that it will crash yeah. maybe it will go into higher orbit that's not been decided at all not the date not the means none of that um, right. But what we do know is that there's, you know, there's a limit to how long this this hardware can last. And we've seen small leaks popping up mm-hmm. over the past few years that they can't seem to fix, um, you know, structural decay. Uh, they need to th- do things like replace batteries. And, you know, it, it's older technology and it's older hardware and it's hardware that, you know, is going through some elements. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it went through a lot to launch. It went through vibrations and heat and all of that. And, and, and even as it's rotating, it's going through cycles of day, night, day, night, day, night, every 90 minutes. And so it's got heat, cold, heat, cold, heat, cold. And that, that takes a toll, right? Not to mention the, the bombardment of micrometeorites and, and space debris that's up there. And I'm not talking about necessarily big things, but the little things that can poke holes and still do a lot of damage. But of course, there is the possibility of bigger things, right? And there is conjunction warnings that allow the space, the the ISS to actually move when it needs to, which it does a few times a year. And that might become more common. And God forbid we ever get into a position where gravity, like that movie Gravity, um, Sandra Bullock, and, and you know, <laughs> I would hope that we never, you know, that's an unrealistic movie as it is. But that that whole concept of, you know, something could actually hit the space station and destroy it, that's real. Um, and so you know, we need to plan ahead. And we don't want to be in a position where we have no capability of getting to space other than maybe the Chinese space station, which which is not continuously inhabited, by the way, they do sorties, they go up and down, they don't have people on board right now, they actually had a crew return um, two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, And so we want to get into a position where we continuously have the option of going to low earth orbit with people. Um, and, and that's important for multiple reasons that probably we don't want to get into just lots of science reasons, like the science that's being done up there, even if we don't know much about it, it's invaluable. And it's really, really important that we continue to learn as much as we can, because this is our future, Mm -hmm. whether or not it's our future for living up there, or whether it's our future just for traveling between planets or wherever we want to go, it is our future to expand outward. So we want to learn as much as we can as as close to home as we can here in low earth orbit as we plan to move outward um and so you know i i i love the space station and i want to see it continue but as i said it was never meant to be cost effective and it's a huge amount of money that nasa spends each year to keep it operational and not just nasa other uh you know other partners and russia every so often pipes up and and threatens to leave early. And so earlier this year, Russia was threatening to leave by 2025. And that was just a political ploy, but a lot of people took it seriously. In fact, I was like, hmm, are they serious this time? They weren't, but (laughs) it's still a consideration, right? Because Russia is the second largest partner with the ISS. And so it's, it's not just a NASA decision. All the partners need to be on board about when they end it and you know when it's going to be you know too much money to keep fixing it and you might not know but mir the the russian space station mir was actually going to become a private facility the russians were going to sell it it became mir core as a company and mir core is going to use it as the first commercial space station in fact there was a one commercial mir mission but it ended up being mostly maintenance because mir was deteriorating and again um, i'm too young to, to really know too much of the history here but we don't want to get to that point where ISS is just too much maintenance and it's not worth it. We want to continuously be able to um, use the new technology and grow beyond what we have now. And then that's why I think commercial companies can do that a lot better than a government agency or government partnership can. So one of the, um, of course, there are many different designs for space stations, but the ones they're talking about now, uh, including, I think, one of the ones that Axiom is contemplating to attach to the ISS and then detach, as you, as you say later, when, when the ISS is end of life, they're inflatable. Mm-hmm. And I have to ask you, would you be comfortable in an inflatable space station? How does that sound to you? 
I'm actually not 100% certain that Axiom's design is inflatable. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm just misremembering. I know uh, Bigelow's. Bigelow, uh, you're Bigelow right. Yes, space, that's the they one. They were a company that actually flew uh, a module that's still attached to the space station that is inflatable. They use it for storage to this day. Um, Sierra Space, which is a subsidiary of Sierra Nevada Corporation, they also want to do inflatable. It seems to be like it's a really great technology. So I'd be perfectly comfortable going up there as long as it's proven <laughs> safe, which so far with the Bigelow beam, module it, it has been proven safe so far so well, it makes I'm, sense I'm, I'm not so picky in the engineering that i'm going to say i'm going to do this and not that no as long as as long as they can say hey it's safe and they can demonstrate it i'm, I'm up there send me up yeah well it's kind of like that winnebago that has the sides that come out right i mean if you're going to get it onto the onto the rocket in the nose cone it has to be a certain size and that's very limiting so i can see why they do it but it just seems I don't know. It, it, I'm, I'm sure you're right, but it just seems like a. So you a, would pass. I, I might pass on that. Yeah, I want to. I want to be able to hear dung 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 when I when I tap the side of it. Um, so here's here's a, a question. Speaking of Elon, time. Do you think uh, Elon will actually be able to retire on Mars, as he has often said? No, um, he might be able to visit. But I don't think okay. we're going to get the infrastructure. Everything takes longer and is much harder than anticipated, right? And so we haven't never even sent people to Mars, like even in the vicinity of Mars. Yeah. All we've done so far, and again, that ended in 1972, was send people to the moon. And right now, we're trying to get that capability back. So first off, we need to prove that we can do that again, which I'm sure we can. Um, but then we need to focus on, okay, what do we want to focus on, right? We need to decide, um, are we going to focus on a lunar base? Are we going to go just do sorties to Mars? And, and, and by sorties, I mean, they're long excursions because it takes a while to get to Mars and back. And there's orbital dynamics in play as to when you want to launch. Um, and that takes a lot of advanced planning. And so the idea is using, using the moon as a test bed to test your technology because the moon is right there. The mm -hmm. moon is a whole lot closer than Mars is. So you want to test all of these different concepts, all of these different technologies, um, you know, business plans, et cetera, to do stuff on the moon, to, to have a, a lunar base or some kind of infrastructure set up and then translate that to Mars. And it's not perfect one-to-one -one translation because the moon is a very different environment than Mars, different gravity, um, essentially no atmosphere on the moon where there is an atmosphere on Mars, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of differences. But it, once we figure out how to live off Earth, that's the first part. Living on a gravity well off Earth, figuring out how, how to live, you know, in situ, how to, how to live off the resources there, whether that is, you know, using it as water, you know, the mining the, the regolith to, um, you know, get the oxygen and the hydrogen and, and figure out how to use the water, um, you know, the ice. It, there's all different ways to, to use it, whether it's um, for drinking purposes, for construction purposes, or maybe you want to make rocket fuel. Um, and we just don't really know how that's all going to play out. So first, I want to see us figure it out on the moon. And I'm more of a moon girl anyway, personally, but I understand the draw that Mars has. So um, I also understand people who are like, I don't want to waste all that time on the moon. Let's go directly to Mars and maybe they'll win out. I don't know. But for right now, the momentum is that we're going to test this stuff on the moon and then go on to Mars. But again, as I said earlier, why limit us? As long as we have private capital that's willing to invest, I can't see why you know we wouldn't go and do both if we don't have to wait for government funding. But this stuff is so expensive that we probably won't need to wait for government funding. Yeah. It's probably going to be a public-private partnership as we're seeing NASA work with companies right now with the Artemis program. So I, I'm with you. I'm really excited about the idea of building something on, on the moon or around the moon because it, it's just so much more likely that we can we can get that down cold. And, and I agree that it's a different environment on Mars, but being isolated in space is a big nut to crack. And if we can get that going on the moon, and as you point out, the, the in-situ resource utilization, it's a great idea. So I'm with you on that. If I may, I'd like to turn attention to your book. It was a great read. There it is up on the shelf. Um, so the book is titled The Rise of the Space Age Millennial. What do you think sets apart the, the millennial cohort from previous cohorts in terms of, in terms of their ambitions in space? 
Now, one of the things that popped up again and again as I was writing this book, and I was writing it the summer that was the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landings, where people were being really nostalgic and retrospective about the lunar landings, which was a fantastic achievement, but millennials were too young to see it. No millennial was old enough to see a lunar landing. Um, in fact, a lot of Generation X was, was too young too. And so um, it's one of those things where you had a whole generation or two inspired by the moon landings, but millennials, as I found it, I talked to over a hundred for this book, were more inspired by what came after, by the space shuttle program or by the commercial space industry, as we're seeing now with the you know, SpaceX, with Virgin Galactic and others. Um, and so that sweats us apart in a lot of ways because we have never seen anyone land on another planet. We have instead seen this evolution of technology coming from private companies, whether it's suborbital space flight or reusable rocketry, which started with Blue Origin and then perfected by SpaceX in a way, um, and, and different ways that the technology keeps changing, the applications keep changing. And seeing it grow too, because it's not just nationalistic anymore. It's not, it's not the US and the Soviet Union. And we talked earlier about the geopolitics with the United States and China right now, but millennials tend to see it, the ones I spoke with tend to see it more broadly, more as an international collaboration and also a business prospect where people from all over the world, you don't have to live in one of those space com countries. You can actually live anywhere and be involved in space because of the commerce aspect, because businesses don't necessarily care. I mean, there's, there's national security concerns. So there is, there is a limitation there, but um, for the most part, you can still get involved in space, even if you don't live in one of those big space players. Uh, and, and that's different. Um, another thing that's different is that millennials were raised continuously connected to the internet for the most part. I mean, we didn't get internet in my house. I'm an older millennial um, until, you know, I was, I was, I was maybe at 10 or 12 or something when I was younger than 12, but in any case, um, you know, for most of our lives, in some cases for all of some of the younger millennials lives, we've all been connected to the internet and that makes our lives much more willing to accept, um, you know, international collaboration. We, we don't even necessarily think, I don't know where you are. I know that I think I saw that you're in Canada somewhere. <laughs> So, but I don't know. Um, and so that's my point, right? Is that we don't necessarily know where the people we are speaking with. So we're not stuck in our silos of this country or that country or, or, or wherever. We, we actually think more broadly and we're also always connected. So, um, we, you know, every one of us has one of these things attached to us at all times, right? We're, we're over here talking to, to people. Um, you know, we're, we're always on, we're always connected. And that is different in the way that we work and the way that we think in the way that we collaborate. And so one of the chapters of that book is like intergenerational working habits and, and how do we work together and, and the ways that we adapt to new technology and the ways that we use like social media to communicate, for example. Um, and, and some millennials are more comfortable with social media communications than others. But for the most part, um, it's, it's very different than older generations. And I'm actually in the process, once I finish, <laughs> once I finish my second book, um, I'm going to be updating the first book. I've already done interviews with uh, the next generation, Generation Z or Zoomers, um, which are even younger population where um, they, the ones I interviewed are university students, so quite young, and they have an even different viewpoint about inclusivity and, and, and involvement of everybody, diversification of the population and people who are involved. And, and that's quite a bit different because when you think about some of the the Apollo era people and it was so very nationalistic and you look at those first astronauts and they were white male fighter pilots uh you know on the on the U.S. side and then on the the on the Soviet side it was a little different they were they were very you know demonstrative of the 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 Soviet unions you know whatever but <laughs> it, the way it is now is completely different where um millennials uh you know the ones I spoke with the majority of them and then also generations Z tends to want to involve the entire human race in a way that has never been seen before. Be, you know, mindfully inclusive of people who were left out come previously. So um, I want to talk to you as an author for a minute and just sort of say, how, how did the empty page grab you? How did you get started? Was it a matter of doing the interviews first and then you felt like you had the raw material or did you start writing and then try to fill in with research? What did you do? Um, so it started as a concept. It started as a little bug in my head saying, and, and this was more like five years ago, 
there were all these stories about millennials are destroying this or millennials are this negative stereotype. And I'm like, well, who are they talking to? <laughs> who are these millennials that they're interviewing that are all very negative stories? I'm like, this is not the story of the people that I know that are my age. Um, and so I'm like, what if I talk to the people that I know and the people that I know work in the space sector? And I wanted to, you know, the space sector also tends to be um, naturally forward thinking. And I, I, I wanted to talk to people who were forward thinking, who were thinking about, you know, broadly where we're going as a human species, you know? And so therefore I'm like, I'm going to do a book where I talk to millennials like me, only I didn't want it to be just people like me. I wanted to reach out to people of other industries and I'm a scientist. So I specifically try to look for people who are not scientists also, you know, I, there are plenty of scientists and engineers in the book, but, you know, I reached out to communicators and educators and business people and also people in the other countries. So um, that was a bit harder because my circle is, you know, more North American based, but um, I really did try to reach out to people in other continents. And yeah, other, LinkedIn. Other, yeah, I tried my best. So I wanted to get more inclusive in the representation within the book. And again, I interviewed over a hundred millennials. So I hope that comes across, but that as I started to talk to more people, then the themes formed because I didn't have the themes initially. In fact, um, some of my interview questions had what I thought the themes were going to be, and those themes were, went out the window. <laughs> in fact, I have a whole version of the book, uh, you know, about uh, a third of the book written that I just threw away after a certain point because I'm like, this is not working. I, I need to come at this in a different way. And the themes really drove, you know, how people answered the questions, not how I intended them to answer, how they, how I expected them to answer, but how they actually answered really helped me figure out what's important to include. And then it all went from there. It was really easy once I had the raw material of the interviews to play with. And in fact, that's kind of how I, I, I wrote my second book here. So I'm at the tail end of finishing the manuscript for my second book, where I've interviewed uh, flown astronauts and future flyers. And um, this time I didn't come in with expectations. I purposely tried not to uh, open ended questions and, and let them tell me what the themes are. And those themes create the chapters. And um, that's how I work. I, I don't know how other authors work, but that's what happened to me. Is, is I've really let them tell the stories, and then I translate their stories onto paper. And then the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing I'm curious about is I noticed that it's published by Astrolytical, which is your consulting firm. So it's self-published in a way. What's your experience with that? Did you what What made you decide to go that route rather than going through an existing publisher? Yeah, I didn't see any point as to taking my time to try to shop around with different agents or different publishers. I didn't see any point to that. Plus, the royalties are a lot better when you self-publish. Um, and and the, my understanding is that, you know, the way that it works modern times, you're doing all the work anyway, even if you go through a publisher. <laughs> I mean, they take care of like the the editing and the the art. And that's that's where I, I struggled, actually. There's going to be a new cover art with the, um, the new version of Rise of the Space Age Millennials. Um, and, and I realized that I can do that. I can do my own social media promotions. I can do, um, you know, I, I have a fantastic editor um, and, and now I have two editors that I'm working with with this, this new book. Um, and so it's one of those things where I was like a no brainer that, you know, I could do it quicker. You know, it also takes a lot longer if you go through a publisher, um, but I could do it quicker if I, you know, if I hired the help myself, if I hired the, you know, it's not just me, right? Um, it's it's also, you know, I had two, three artists involved and two editors and a graphic designer for that first book. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's a lot of, that goes into it. And with a publisher, they do all that. Um, mm -hmm. And except for the marketing. And I'm like, I could do the marketing. This <laughs> yeah. And, and you're, and you're entrepreneurial I and mean, you have your own firm. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and I wanted Astrolytical to be a publishing firm as well as a consulting firm, because we do publish already reports. Reports don't have their own ISBN. It's the, the number that's associated with a book. You know, the reports aren't sold on Amazon, for example. Um, but, you know, Astrolytical, in a sense, was already publishing content. So why not make it a publisher of books as well? So you've said, you said a couple of times you're not a historian, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I wonder if um, in the process of writing this book, something jumped out at you about the difference between the silent generation, so the, the Apollo generation of astronauts, and today's generation. You've talked a little bit about the inclusiveness, about not being so stridently nationalistic, but what other differences do you see? 
Um, so the ways that people work quite different. Um, you know, there's, and some of this is life stages as well, where someone who's straight out of college is going to have a different perspective than someone who's raising a family is going to have a different perspective than someone who's near retirement age. Um, but just the ways that people, um, prefer to work or the ways that they approach work are quite different. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think, I, I, <laughs> what are the other themes in there? Those well, are like uh, one of them I want to pick up on, uh, is, uh, the multitasking. Mm, was something okay. you really you really uh, went into in some detail. Did you come to a conclusion on whether it's a good idea or not? No, and that wasn't to the point of the chapter either. I mean, there's been studies done that say multitasking is terrible, but I still multitask all the time. Um, <laughs> it's really a personal preference, right? And I don't think that's generational. I think that's simply a personal preference based on you know how people decide to operate. And it was something I wanted to explore to see if I could see a difference between generations or, or to see if I could figure out, you know, um, why people prefer working on one thing at a time versus working on many things at a time. And, and really I leave it up to the reader to see if they, you know, it's probably my own bias, what I conclude, um, but <laughs> maybe the reader concludes something else based on their own perspective. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to point out by even including that is that there's, there's no right way to do something, right? There's no right way to work. I mean, as long as you're working ethically, there's, there's no wrong way to, to work on many projects at once or to see you know, one project at a time or to see a project from start to finish versus, you know, jumping around from project to project. Some projects take decades, literally. Um, and so there's no right way. It's just, I wanted to include that to tell the reader that there's all these different methods of working and maybe the reader can decide how they prefer to work. Yeah. And, and as the reader, I think I, I, I think you and I came to a similar conclusion, which is it depends on how finely you divide your time, right? Mm -hmm. It really is a, a matter of knowing your own strengths and weaknesses about how long can you work on one thing? And how, how long does it take you to recover when you change the task? So I think, I think you're right. It, it really, it's, not a, it's not a generational thing at all. It's, it's a personal thing. And this book was published before the pandemic, about two months before the pandemic. And so um, I think that even some of our work styles have changed in the past year and a half, yeah. where we are, you know, for, for those of us who went from an office environment to working at home, I think now we we are more used to even being more divided, um, whether we're watching, you know, family members or, you know, talking with, with our, our spouse or, um, you know, housemates or doing laundry or dishes at the same time we're on a conference call, you know, I think those kinds of environmental uh, concerns or, or situations will also impact how we work. And that's not in the book because that book was not published yet. Uh, when this happened, I think the pandemic has definitely changed our mindsets and how, and what's possible. Yeah. Well, it is a terrific book and this has been a fascinating conversation. I have one last question. Um, and that is what is the most exciting space project going on right now that you don't think gets enough attention? What do you think people should be looking at more? Oh, well, I mean, like I'm in my space circle, right? But outside of the space community, people have no idea what's going on. And I try to tell them, I try to keep some of them informed. Hey, we landed a, a rover on Mars or a helicopter is flying on Mars. Or, you know, we're, we're about to launch this massive James Webb Space Telescope or we're sending people to the moon. Like how many people have heard of the Artemis program outside of the space community? I don't think many people have. Um, and so that's what I'm excited about actually is the most because I personally want to go to the moon and there has never been a woman on the moon. And so one of the things the Artemis program is focused on is sending the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And you know, I just want to go back, you know, as, as humanity, I want us to go back. And I think it's especially important for people to see representative of who they are on the moon, that they too can do that. Uh, and just like how we saw, you know, like Inspiration4, for example, we talked about how that is more representative of humanity because we had someone there, the first black woman uh, pilot of a spacecraft, the first person with a prosthesis on a, a space flight, you know, representative of, of more people who are everyday people who we see. And so you never know who you're gonna touch, who you're gonna inspire, who you're gonna change the lives of by showing what's already happening. And we don't do enough of that. And so, uh, you know, outside of the space community, all of it, we, we need to talk about more of it, all of it. And of course I'm biased, I love this stuff, but I think it's really important that we are going outwards and we need to bring all of humanity with us. And that includes telling people, hey, and especially here in the United States, I tell people, this is your tax dollars. This is, this is your program, your space program that's going out there and exploring. So pay attention to it. 
Well, Laura, thank you so much for coming on my show to share your thoughts on that. I'm getting the more attention for it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. My guest today was Laura Forzik. A link to Laura's profile on LinkedIn and her book, Rise of the Space Age Millennials, will be in the show notes. My name is Tim Hampton, and you can reach me at tim at unusuallywellinformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation. 